Arnold and White in D.C. will uh, speak about <coughs> procedural issues in patent litigation. Then Jim Lambert, down from Hale and Door in Boston, will discuss the doctrine of equivalence and prosecution history estoppel. And finally, the Honorable Terence Boyle, uh, the Chief Judge for the Eastern District of North Carolina, will give us a trial court's perspective on intellectual <coughs> property litigation. As I said, Dave Long is of counsel at Harry Simon, Arnold and White. He earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Auburn University and a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering, also from Auburn University. He received his JD with honors, magna cum laude, from the University of, Alaba uh, University of Alabama. And he clerked for the Honorable Edward Smith on the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Uh, David has, uh, focuses his practice on complex intellectual property and patent litigation, client counseling, and electrical and mechanical patent prosecution. Mr. Long's title, uh, talk is entitled, Holmes Group Against Bornado, Air Circulation Systems, Where Do We Go From Here? Mr. Long. Thank you. I'm going to see if I can get this, get this roaming mic on, in case I want to get. Well, I'm here to discuss the... Uh, Holmes Group ver versus Vernado decision by the Supreme Court. I don't know how many people uh, have heard about that decision. Quite honestly, that decision kind of snuck up on the patent bar, in fact. Uh, people were surprised to have seen it. The Holmes, Gr Holmes Group versus Vernado decision uh, concerns the Federal Circuit's appellate jurisdiction over patent cases. And we'll get into it, but at the, the bottom line is the Supreme Court decided that the Federal Circuit doesn't have to hear all patent cases, that even though they were created to form uniform patent law, uh, to provide predictability in patent law, some things have to give way in that mandate uh, to other more important concerns. If I have this right, uh, what I'd like to talk about is the uh, first just a brief intro to the Federal Circuit's appellate jurisdiction in general, where it's based, how it's relevant to this case, uh, then discuss the Holmes v. Vernado ruling. Uh, the procedural history of the case, which you really need to understand to understand the, the implications of the court's ruling, kind of some of the arguments that were raised for and against the Federal Circuit having jurisdiction in that case, and then ultimately what the Supreme Court's decision was. There was a majority decision and two concurrences. Those two concurrences will be very interesting to see what the regional circuits do with this case going forward. Uh, and then after that, just a, a brief discussion of where do we go from here, and, and quite honestly, hopefully after this talk, maybe some other folks will have suggestions too, or things they may have encountered where the Holmes v. Vernado uh, decision had an impact. But we, we'll want to know what should uh, patent owners and litigants consider? Uh, what should the regional circuits consider? It's been 20 years since they've considered patent cases. They may start getting a few. And then what should the Federal Circuit do, and, and what message, if any, was sent to the Federal Circuit based on that decision? So initially, what is the Federal Circuit's jurisdiction? Some of you may know, but just in, in case you don't, the Federal Circuit has a unique subject matter jurisdiction over the matters that it hears appeals on. Uh, principally, the Federal Circuit was formed to hear appeals of all patent cases, of uh, things arising under the patent law. The Federal Circuit also hears some other uh, appeals from certain agencies and all, but that's the main reason they're there. Now, that's in contrast to the regional circuits. Um, for example, the 11th Circuit, uh, hears appeals from things within its geographical area, uh, regardless of subject matter. And so that's a unique position that the Federal Circuit is in. And so the, the question is, well, why, why did we do that? In the, uh, in the early 80s, there was a movement and complaints about patent law being very unpredictable, about people form shopping. You could go to one regional circuit and, and more readily invalidate a patent than if you go to another one. So the thought was, if we have just one appellate court that hears all patent law issues, that can add some uniformity to patent law and solve some of those problems that were encountered. Uh, if you have uniform patent law, then you have more predictability in the patent. Uh, it may give the patent more value because people know how to uh, assess the value of the patent based on a validity and an infringement standpoint. Um, it can also... Um, and some of the form shopping... That, that we saw with patent law. As you can imagine, patents can, can shut down a business, perhaps, stop a product altogether. 
And so there's a lot at stake. And, and the initial place where you file the case could have a very big impact on what the resolution of the case would be. And, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Here's uh, some of the more mundane stuff, but, it, but we need to know it to, to understand the case, which is the basis for the Federal Circuit's jurisdiction. The uh, Federal Circuit has its jurisdiction through the district courts, through the grant to the district court of original jurisdiction over cases arising under, and that's the key word, arising under the patent laws. Now that language and that statute mirrors a general federal question jurisdiction statute, which says district courts have jurisdiction over cases arising under, and that's the magic language, arising under um, basically federal statutes, etc. So there's a parallel between those two statutes, and that's going to come into play in the decision, ultimately, of the Supreme Court. Uh, so what was the ruling, just to, to let you know where we're going with the ruling? The Supreme Court ruled that the appellate jurisdiction of, uh, I would assume, really any appellate court, it will be based on the well-pleaded complaint uh, and will not be based on the counterclaims filed in that complaint. What that means is if you file a complaint alleging, say, trade dress, uh, infringement or that you don't infringe someone's trade dress, the other side counters and says, well, you do infringe it and you infringe my patent, uh, under this rule, um, that counterclaim is not going to be considered in determining which court to go to. Based on that ruling and in this particular case, the Supreme Court said that the Federal Circuit would not have jurisdiction over a patent infringement action where the complaint itself did not vest the Federal Circuit with jurisdiction. And so what that means is that after 20 years since the Federal Circuit was created in 1982, regional circuits may start to hear some patent infringement cases, which they haven't for that time. And so what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Well, let's get into the, into the procedural history of the case. And to get into it, we first have to explain a case that happened before this case, which I'll call Vernado 1. Vernado makes fans. You all may have seen these fans, they have kind of a radiating spiral that, that goes out and curves, and, and they have uh, a claim that that's uh, their trade dress, that particular unique design. And they also have patents covering some aspects of that uh, grill on the fan as well. Well, in the early 90s, they sued a company called Duracraft, and they sued them in the Tenth Circuit, saying that Duracraft infringed their trade dress. The Tenth Circuit disagreed. The Tenth Circuit said, uh, you don't have protectable trade dress protection because you got a patent on this, and so it must be all functional. So there's no trade dress protection. And, uh, and so Venato was stuck without trade dress protection. So what do they do? They see the Holmes Group is selling, importing into the United States some fans that they think infringe their patent but also infringe their trade dress. What do they do? They don't want to go to the Tenth Circuit. Uh, oh, before I get to that, this ruling by the Venado court was a minority decision. Most other regional circuits that ever considered the issue went the other way and said, uh, you know, you could have uh, trade dress protection even though you do have a patent covering some aspect of this technology. It all depends. In fact, the Federal Circuit was one of the biggest criticizers of this decision when they got the chance because the Federal Circuit is supposed to look out for patent law, so they felt uh, the need to really correct the court, at least in their opinion, of what they thought of that decision. So Venato, knowing that the Tenth Circuit didn't like their trade dress, knowing that the Federal Circuit didn't like the Tenth Circuit decision, decided to uh, go after Holmes and the International Trade Commission. I don't know, uh, uh, well, what the International Trade Commission is, they're an agency that a patent owner can go to and say, someone's importing a product that infringes my patent and you need to stop them. Uh, and what you do is you institute an investigation, it's called. And so they institute an investigation in the ITC to determine whether or not Holmes fans actually uh, uh, violated Bernardo's trade dress. And you're thinking, well, wait a second, the Tenth Circuit said you had no trade dress. Well, um, the appeal from the ITC goes to the Federal Circuit. It's not going to go to the Tenth Circuit, so you have a chance. So you're the Holmes group, and you're thinking, well, I don't want to go to the Federal Circuit because they said the Tenth Circuit decision was wrong, and I want to go with the Tenth Circuit. So what do you do if you're the Holmes group? You file a declaratory judgment action as they did within the Tenth Circuit, saying we want a declaration, a judgment that we do not infringe the trade dress. 
So they filed in the District Court for Kansas and Tenth Circuit law should control. And what they did is they filed a complaint and they made sure their complaint didn't even breathe the word patent. Their complaint sought a declaratory judgment that uh, their fans did not infringe Vernado's trade dress. Vernado, liking the Federal Circuit, not liking the Tenth Circuit decision and because the facts were really related, filed a counterclaim saying that not only do you infringe my trade dress, but you infringe my patent. Well, the district court considered the uh, trade dress issue, being within the Tenth Circuit and the Tenth Circuit's law being binding, said, Bernardo, you're collaterally stopped from saying anyone infringes your trade dress because, according to us, you don't have any. The district court then entered a Rule 54B judgment on the trade dress issue. What does that mean? You have one case, you have trade dress issues, you have patent infringement issues. Trade dress issues have been resolved, so under Rule 54B, you can say, hey, let's enter final judgment on this so the parties can continue on at the appellate level and get this part of the case over with. So there's 54B judgment entered on the trade dress issue alone. The patent case uh, remained pending in the district court. Well, Vernado, having the choice between the Tenth Circuit and the Federal Circuit, decides to go where? He, he decides to go to the Federal Circuit that has a more favorable view of their trade dress rights. Where Holmes says, wait a second, that's the counterclaim. Uh, this, your appellate jurisdiction says of rising under patent law. That should follow the well-pleaded complaint rule. Counterclaims don't count. The Tenth Circuit should hear our trade dress claim, and we really want them to. Well, the Federal Circuit uh, essentially ignored that plea. They uh, reversed the trade dress judgment because an intervening Supreme Court decision had come out. Uh, they said that that may raise an exception to the collateral estoppel rule. As in, if you adjudicated something before and you lost, you shouldn't get to adjudicate it, adjudicate it again. But if there's a big change in the law, maybe you should. And so the Federal Circuit said, well, maybe now the Tenth Circuit will not only agree with what we said about their decision, but perhaps the Supreme Court's decision will sway them to think, yeah, there's trade dress protection here. And uh, the Federal Circuit's decision was a non-precedential decision. Uh, that didn't even mention the jurisdiction issue. Why is that important? Um, if you issue a non-presidential opinion, you're saying, we're not saying anything new here. This is no new law. It's not a big deal. And if you don't even discuss the jurisdiction issue, you're saying, in fact, the jurisdiction issue was such a, a no-brainer that we're not even going to talk about it. So now you have the Holmes Group that would love to be in the Tenth Circuit um, trying to figure out how are they going to get the Supreme Court to take this case this case that was a non-presidential opinion uh, that doesn't even mention jurisdiction. Well, they try anyhow. Um, they sought review in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court granted certiorari, which is not an easy thing to do, and, it, and it's made folks wonder, well, why did they grant it? And, and we'll, we'll get to that, or at least speculation about that shortly. This case kind of snuck in under, under everyone's radar. In fact, there's only one amicus brief filed. It was from the Patent, Trademark, and Copyright section of the Bar Association of D.C. I know that because I was on the amicus committee and filed it. And I guess, and, and what we argued was that the Federal Circuit should have jurisdiction uh, because their mandate to have uniform patent law should control. And my argument was so persuasive that the Supreme Court ruled that the Federal Circuit did not have appellate jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that brings us here. So what did they consider? What did the Supreme Court consider this, this argument? And there's all kind of distinction of cases and all that. I won't get into that, but there's kind of some main arguments that, and, and policies that the Federal Circuit considered. Uh, as far as reasons why the Federal Circuit shouldn't have jurisdiction, the argument that I've laid the foundation for is that, uh, look, they use a rising under, a rising under the patent law, just like you use a rising under federal law, to say that's the basis for jurisdiction. While there's well-settled case law that a rising under means you look at the well-pleaded complaint. You don't look at the defendant's answer. You don't look at their defenses. Uh, there had never been a ruling whether or not you looked at the counterclaims, but they said that's still the same thing because under the well-pleaded complaint rule, the plaintiff should be the master of the court that adjudicates their rights. You shouldn't let the defendant come in and uh, change which form you're in. The arguments for saying that the Federal Circuit should have jurisdiction was one, 
let's look at the well-pleaded complaint rule. It was really directed to what's called removal cases. Um, the, the statute granting original jurisdiction over a, a federal questions basically means should this issue be considered in the state court or the federal court? If someone files a claim in the state court, should you be able to remove that to the federal court? And we're going to give that a lot of consideration because state courts don't like us taking cases away from them. They'd like to adjudicate the rights of their citizens. And so you should give some due respect to the state court before you remove a case. And, and so one of the things, again, is you shouldn't be able to remove it from state court if you uh, just file an answer or counterclaim just to manipulate federal circuit jurisdiction. So one argument is that, look, all that stuff dealt with a federal circuit or federal court deference to state court. We don't have that here. We're just talking about which federal court gets this appeal. Is it going to be the federal circuit or somebody else? And when faced with that question, Congress has answered it. Congress said it was more important to have a uniform patent law to have one court hear all issues, patent cases. And as, as you may know, when you appeal a patent case to the federal circuit, you appeal the whole kit and caboodle. Everything goes there. Patent issues, non-patent issues alike. Congress has already decided that, and uh, so the federal circuit should have jurisdiction. Again, the Supreme Court, considering that argument as persuasive <laughs> as it was, the majority said there was no federal circuit jurisdiction. Uh, and their reasoning was that, look, there's this arising under language. Whatever we say here for these patent cases and whatever rule we talk about for the well-pleaded complaint, we're going to have to live with, with these removal cases, too, because this says arising under. So we're going to stick with the idea that you don't consider the counterclaim, just like you don't consider defenses, et cetera. Why? You want the plaintiff to be the master of the complaint. That's the fundamental premise of the well-pleaded complaint rule. Um, you don't want to have too many removal cases brought up to federal district court uh, based on people bringing counterclaims, defendants just bringing some kind of federal question counterclaim just to move the whole action from state court to federal court. Again, you want state courts to adjudicate the rights of their citizens when it's appropriate. And also, uh, if you start getting into considering counterclaims and other thing, things, you start making things complicated. You know, does someone file a counterclaim just to manufacture uh, federal court jurisdiction? You, are you going to start inquiring about that? Well, no. We're just going to have a real simple rule that you look at the complaint and that's it. So now considering that, uh, okay, we're not going to change the well-pleaded complaint rule, well, they create an exception for the federal circuit. And, uh, and they said, no, we construe words and what they mean. And as far as trying to fulfill the intent of Congress, if we try to stray too far from the plain meaning of the words, we, we have a problem, so we're not going to do it. And so their conclusion, which surprised the patent practitioners, I think, when the case came out, because I think this had pretty much snuck under radar, was that not all cases involving a patent law claim will fall within the federal circuit's jurisdiction. Now there's uh, concurrences that we need to consider in this opinion to figure out where do we go with this opinion. One of them that kind of put a little bit more of the nail in the coffin was Justice Stevens' concurrence. He agreed that appellate jurisdiction should be based on the claims of the complaint. He said in addition to all the things that the the majority talked about that the regional circuits themselves have an interest in hearing the uh, and, and solving disputes between people within their geographical location, just like states do for theirs. And he was also concerned that the federal circuit would start creating too much law to other areas not related to patent law. For example, in the Holmes v. Vernado case, the federal circuit was opining on trade dress law, opining on it in contravention of what the Tenth Circuit had even said. And I, I think that uh, bothered Justice Stevens. And again, by not considering the counterclaim, he agreed you have a clear, simple rule. Uh, but he went further, and he said, in fact, regional circuit review of federal circuit cases uh, is a good thing. And so the patent, patent, patent practitioners kind of shrugged their shoulders and looked and said, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, they said, well, look, uh, he says, an occasional conflict between the federal circuit and the regional circuit uh, will let us know what things we should review. You know, what issues have such merit that we should go ahead and hear it, because it's hard to tell otherwise. That's one of the bases for Supreme Court granting cert. He also said that, uh, and this was uh, you know, the last uh, condemning statement, but that uh, occasional decisions by a court of general jurisdiction may actually be a good thing. That the federal circuit as a specialized court might develop an institutional bias 
In fact, he cites a, some study that said that the federal circuit was mo, more pro-patent uh, than regional circuits. And so if you get regional circuits hearing whatever number of cases this would affect, coming at it with a fresh approach, maybe they might come up with a better, more workable answer than the federal circuit. One other concurrence to consider is Ginsburg, who O'Connor joined. Uh, they thought you should give effect to the congressional intent. Um, Congress wanted a uniform patent law, was going to accomplish that through one court to hear the appeal, and you should give effect to that. Their only, the only reason they concurred in the outcome was that in this case, recall the trade dress claim had been adjudicated and ruled a final judgment. The patent case was still pending. They said since no patent decision has been adjudicated, the appellate circuit, the federal circuit's appellate jurisdiction didn't attach. So now this raises a question, where do we go from here? What would patent owners and litigants do? Uh, probably, for now, probably a lot of guessing, but what would regional circuits do when they start hearing these patent cases? And what should the Federal Circuit take from, uh, from this ruling? First, let's consider what patent owners and litigants uh, should consider. One of the immediate outbursts from the patent bar that was kind of surprised by this uh, decision was that we need to overturn this decision. And so, in fact, the uh, Federal Circuit Bar Association, I believe, is proposing legislation to uh, overturn Holmes v. Vernado and make sure the Federal Circuit hears all patent cases, that nothing leaks through to a regional circuit. What else are litigants going to do? Well, now there's that old specter of form shopping, because you may be able to manipulate it, so you can either go to the Federal Circuit or to a regional circuit. Um, whatever form shopping we may have as a result of this decision is probably going to be limited. Uh, uh, before the Federal Circuit, you could choose which regional circuit you went to fairly readily just by satisfying basic form and venue provisions. Now you have to go a little bit further. Um, for Federal Circuit jurisdiction, if, if, that, if you think the Federal Circuit law will help you, you'll just do what you've been doing, which is the patentee will file an infringement complaint. The complaint uh, arises under patent law and it will go to the Federal Circuit. The accused infringer uh, will file a declaratory judgment of non-infringement, uh, assuming the grounds are there for that. That would be in the original complaint. It would arise under patent law and go to the Federal Circuit. The trickier issue comes in, how do you get the Regional Circuit to review this if you think for some reason the Regional Circuit is going to have better law for you than the Federal Circuit? It requires a little bit of manipulation of the other party. If you're the accused infringer, you're going to do at least what the uh, Holmes Group did. They're going to file a non-patent claim complaint in court, don't even breathe the word patent, and hopes that you draw out a patent infringement counterclaim. And then there's some issue, you, in fact, you might have to bring that patent infringement counterclaim if it's compulsory. And for example, in the Holmes v. Vornado case, the Supreme Court assumed that that case was compulsory. And if you did that then, your complaint didn't breathe patent law, the counterclaim does, and that'll go to whatever regional circuit uh, you were able to get venue in. If you're the patentee, it's going to be a little bit more trickier, because somehow you've got to bait the accused infringer to sue you on something. Um, and when they bring that non-patent complaint, then you surprise them with your, uh, your infringement counterclaim when you go to the regional circuit. How do you decide which would be better for you if you could pull this off somehow? Um, some people assume that the uh, accused infringer is going to like the regional circuit. Remember that study from Justice Stevens? Uh, I mean, that the study that Justice Stevens references, it says the Federal Circuit is pro-patent, so maybe you'd want to go to the Regional Circuit. There's some evidence for that. Um, the, a study of uh, 11th Circuit case law, I believe, shows that under the 11th Circuit, it may be easier to invalidate a patent uh, if you're doing it based on prior art that the Patent Office hadn't considered. If you're saying this patent's invalid based on this piece of prior art the Patent Office didn't consider it, you just have a preponderance of the evidence standard. In the Federal Circuit, you still have a clear and convincing evidence burden of standard, uh, uh, burden of proof. That standard never changes, even if it was prior art that was not considered by the Patent Office. So that might be one reason you'd rather go to the Eleventh Circuit, perhaps, in the Federal Circuit, if you could work that out. Um, but accused infringers also might not mind the Federal Circuit, either. Uh, the Federal Circuit has gotten a lot stricter about uh, what it takes to 
describe and enable your invention uh, than, than the law had been beforehand. And the Federal Circuit certainly has had a recent move to limit uh, the patentee's ability to prove infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. And in fact, as a litigator, you'd rather have a better non-infringement case than an invalidity case because the burden's on them to prove infringement. Now, here's one issue, too, to consider. What are the regional circuits going to do now that they start getting some of these technology cases? Um, they used to handle them, so hopefully they can handle them now. What does the Federal Circuit do? The Federal Circuit, the bulk of what they do is patent cases. So they have resources they can dedicate specifically to patent cases. In fact, they're specifically authorized to have senior technical advisors, people with technical backgrounds that they can have employed as full time uh, to help them with cases if they choose. Not only that, the judges, when they hire law clerks, will look at people that have technical backgrounds. Uh, maybe people that have worked uh, as a patent attorney or as an examiner at the patent office. That's very common. So you have people that not only know the technology, but they also are a lot further along on the patent law issues than, than, uh, than most law clerks normally would be. And what about district courts? Some district courts hear enough patent cases, like in Delaware, the, the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, they hear enough patent cases where they may they may themselves seek out law clerks that have some kind of technology background because they just, a, a lot of their cases fall in the patent area. And even if they don't, a district court can get a special master to instruct them on the technology and make the parties pay for it. So the district courts have options that the, uh, the, federal, that the regional circuits may not. So um, I'm not sure what the regional circuits did before 1982. Uh, I don't know if the technology is well and, and what's being litigated is more complex than before. You know, a lot of cases are litigated over simple mechanical things. And, and so, you know, you push here, this moves there, and, and you don't really need much of a degree on that. There's other things that you can really get lost in it. And uh, since 1982, the law has been changed so that claim construction is now a, a question of law. What does that mean? That means the district court has to read this complex technical document called a patent they have to understand it from the viewpoint of one of ordinary skill. They need to read the file history of the patent, what happened in the patent office, understand that from the viewpoint of one of ordinary skill, and then issue a claim construction that is in technical terms and uh, construes the claim as one of ordinary skill would do. That's a burden that the, the court is going to have to do. Um, so that may be different than, uh, you know, regional circuits here technology cases all the time, right? right? Product liability, uh, you know, they, they deal with technology, but I don't know if those cases require the courts to roll their uh, sleeves up and dig into the technology as much because they may be reviewing factual issues determined by a jury, which is a substantial evidence standard. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. The other question is what law will the regional circuit apply in the cases where they get these um, patent cases. They could defer to the Federal Circuit law. Uh, in fact, you would think they'd at least use whatever the Federal Circuit is saying today as some kind of informal, non-binding guidance as to what to do at, at a minimum. Uh, they could say that what the Federal Circuit says is binding law, that uh, Congress created the Federal Circuit to, to provide uniform national patent law, and by golly, that's what we're going to have to do. And In fact, that latter view might uh, be agreed, uh, Justice Ginsburg and uh, O'Connor may agree with that based on their concurrences. What the regional circuit also could do is just dust off the books, pull up their pre-1982 case law and, and start going from there. Um, certainly Justice Stevens uh, would agree with that approach. Uh, so lastly, and what I'm talking about here is what should the Federal Circuit do? What messages, if any, should the Federal Circuit get from this decision that you're important, it's great that you're going to create um, uniform patent law, but you're not so important that other issues aren't important as well. Uh, one of the first things they've done is transferred cases to regional circuits. Um, the very first case they transferred to a regional circuit that I'm aware of went to the 11th circuit. And so, uh, you know, we were looking at should we file an amicus brief there to help guide the 11th circuit as to what law they should consider. But I believe that case has been stayed because one of the parties is in bankruptcy. Um, 
and I think there's been some other cases. What the Federal Circuit might need to do is reevaluate the extent and the place in the law of their mandate to create a uniform and predictable patent law. Uh, why is that? In, um, in, in, in more recent history, the Federal Circuit has been um, criticized by some people for, for overreaching into other areas that aren't patent law. Justice Stevens, for example, um, commented he was concerned about the Federal Circuit opining on non-patent issues. There was a significant uh, antitrust case, uh, Xerox v. somebody, um, where the Federal Circuit, as I understand it, said they're going to adopt their own antitrust law. And in fact, the decision that they rendered went against what the regional circuit's uh, law would have dictated for them to do. Uh, and then there's other areas of law as well where they've just been criticized that, hey, yeah, you've got to provide uniform patent law, but now you're starting to get into our area and we don't like it. Um, I don't know who's familiar with the Festo decision, or decisions, we're at like Festo 4 now or something. Um, but in that decision, the Federal Circuit essentially acted like a, a super legislature, I would think. They said, look, we've tried prosecution history estoppel for a long time this way, but you know what, it's just not working, so we're just going to do a complete about face, and we're going to try this way. That's going to add some predictability, and that's good, have predictability. So, we're just gonna, so they just openly acknowledged they were uh, just taking a different, different route. And they did so uh, perhaps in the face of Supreme Court precedent saying otherwise. And so the Supreme Court, what it said and, and what some people think was implicated was, hey, Federal Circuit, you've, you've gone a little bit further than you should have. Um, I also think that uh, some of the judges have recognized uh, limits on their ability to provide predictability in the patent law. Um, Federal Circuit is near and dear to me, having clerked there and all, and, and I think they're very noble and very committed to fulfilling their mandate, which is to provide uniformity and predictability in patent law. Um, but I think they're starting to realize that there's limits to that. Um, Judge Plager, I believe it was, and a Caterpillar decision involving uh, means plus function limitations, one of the most difficult limitations to understand, uh, a, a judge who's been working, like with Judge Michelle as well, to try to really narrow down equivalence and add predictability, I think in that case, in a concurrence, recognize that there's only so much predictability you can do. The fact is, whether or not something is equivalent is a judgment call at the end of the day. Is this a substantial change or not? There's only so much you can say to that, and I think Judge Plager recognized that we've done as good as we can do with our rules, none of them are perfect, and uh, may the best attorney win. And also, in the, I believe it was in the Festo decision, Judge Newman said, look, that's great, you want to add all this predictability, but you know what, sometimes people just have to have their day in court. And so we don't need to add predictability at, at the expense of denying someone their day in court uh, to litigate uh, equivalents. And then the, the last thing that might uh, give a message to the Federal Circuit as far as its mandate and where it fits in the great circle of life is uh, the grant of certiorari and the decision in the Holmes case. Again, it, it, there was an uphill battle to get the Supreme Court to grant cert on a non-precedential opinion that didn't even mention the issue appealed, and, and they succeeded. And, and some people wondered then, was the Supreme Court giving a message there of reaching down, taking that case, and, and doing what they did? And uh, now I think I have uh, maybe 30 seconds or less if there's any <laughs> questions. I think I ran over. I'm sorry. You're only just down. Oh, Mike. Correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, but you said at the beginning that the 11th Circuit said that the arising under language in the Federal Circuit Act um, must be interpreted the same as the arising under language in Section 1331. Is that correct? I don't think it was the Federal, I don't think it was the 11th Circuit. I think that's what the uh, Supreme Court said, and that's what the parties argued. Oh, I don't. Uh, I apologize. You might have to repeat that. Was that unclear? Yeah. Well, I'm having a hard time hearing. Is is why. What I'm what I'm saying is, the same language is used in Article Three of the Constitution, 
characteristics oh. that are important. And that is construed very broadly. Why 3031 requires a white data complaint. And if you you could argue that the act giving jurisdiction to the federal circuit court should be construed as the thought of it in the Constitution rather than 1331. I see what you're saying. That's a good point. And, and I wish you were helping me brief that a year ago because I would have loved to have had that. Um, and it's interesting, uh, just a, a side point, there's going to be some problems created with this decision. For example, I believe there's a state court that decided it would hear a copyright claim because it was raised in a counterclaim. And under the well-pleaded complaint rule, they didn't consider that. And I know at least for patent claims, and I think it's true for copyright claims, uh, but certainly for patent claims, the uh, statute is clear that the federal courts have exclusive jurisdiction over patent cases. And so if you have a patent counterclaim in the district court and they ignore the counterclaim, well, uh, what do you do with that? I don't know. Yes? I'm going to go out on a limb and guess you saw the oral arguments. You know what? I uh, was doing another, I was out of town <laughs> on a hearing. I wish I... Uh, well, then I, I can't ask my question. <laughs> I've, I, I've been to, people told me about it and had I mixed reviews. You got any sense about whether this is being driven by a, a strict reading of, of the rules as they're prone to do up there from time to time, or if there was some real sense of needing to rein in the federal circuit on the part of the judges who didn't come right out and say that the way Stevens did? I know a lot of people speculate that, and not having been there, I don't know the tenor of the questions. Uh, I did review the transcript. I think that's a very good point, and I think a lot of people are thinking that's why they reached down. Because uh, during all this, there's uh, some Federal Trade Commission uh, activity concerning antitrust law and the interaction of that with patent law. And uh, uh, so this was a hot topic at the time. And I think it's fair to say there's at least one other. Federal Circuit has had a couple of strange cases that have gone to the Supreme Court recently, one of which was that case, what is now maybe two years ago, where they basically decided that even though a company owner had not been brought in as a party at trial, they could it was perfectly all right to enter judgment against him because had he brought, been brought in, the result would have been the same anyway. A minor due process issue. <laughs> but it didn't bother the Federal Circuit. It did bother the Supreme Court. They reached down, they grabbed it, they pulled it up, and they reversed it. Mm -hmm. And which is, you could say, is fairly much what they did here. The Federal Circuit has clearly been expansive in its jurisdiction. Yes. Yes, definitely. And I think the Supreme Court may have said, hey, wait a minute, you have gone beyond the bounds of that if you read the Festo decision, it's a fascinating decision because the Supreme Court spends the first, what, eight or ten pages just beating the Federal Circuit around the head, and then they effectively affirm. <laughs> the, the, well, we'll get there, get there yeah. later, but uh, there's some interesting, clearly some interesting byplays going on. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's correct. Well, I'm, uh, I'm finished, and I appreciate you all's, uh, all's patience. Thanks. <laughs>
Mr. Gadish. He will speak on current issues in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you very much, Ken, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, the Duke Law School for inviting me here. It's always great to get out of Washington, especially these days, but I'll tell you what, I have a bone to pick with all you folks from North Carolina. It's been, a tu you, you've, it's been tough, you've been tough on us, us Washington people, for the last week or so. First of all, the Tar Heels beat the Terps in the ACC tournament last weekend, and uh, we're hoping to get some revenge uh, in the NCAAs. And then we, you guys had the guy with the tractor in the reflecting pond for about three <laughs> days up in Washington who re that uh, really screwed up traffic, right, Dave? <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put that aside, too. And uh, not, to make the light, not to make light of the situation at all uh, with respect to the, the, the situation in the, in the Middle East, and I'm sure... Uh, you and, and along with I are, uh, hope that our uh, men and women in the Middle East uh, uh, complete their mission safely and are home soon. Uh, I was asked to talk about hot topics at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and the question was, which hot topic <laughs> should I pick? Obviously, I think uh, from, a, from a management's perspective at the USPTO, uh, the fact that uh, our Undersecretary Jim Rogan has uh, introduced some, some fairly sweeping proposals and changes that would affect uh, the U.S. PTO and those that practice before the PTO. I think I'd like to, to talk about those, the, the strategic plan that's been proposed by Jim Rogan and is now uh, being considered up, up on the Hill. But before I talk about changes, I think it's probably appropriate to talk about where we stand today, a little bit of uh, kind of background at with respect to the PTO. Uh, PTO right now, close to 7,000 employees. About 3,500 of those employees are the patent examining core, the, the engineers and scientists that, that examine the applications uh, for patent. The total population of the patent and trademark office on the patent side is about 5,000 employees these days and then uh, trademarks and the other organ support organizations make up the rest of the PTO. Uh, we collect over a billion dollars in user fees, and uh, it's a controversy that you're well aware of, the use of those user fees, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but the bottom line is even though we collect over a billion dollars in user fees, we're still in the appropriations process in front of Congress, and as you well know, where we have not in recent years been appropriated all of those monies. So some of the user fees have gone on for, for other uses within government. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes because that, that is a, uh, a topic that I'm sure that you all will have interest in. Uh, business is booming at the USPTO. Last year, 335,000 applications for patent were filed at the USPTO. Uh, we've seen growth in terms of the volume of applications and also growth in terms of the complexity of applications. 2000 and 2001, we saw double-digit growth in the, in the number of applications filed. Well, last year in 2002, maybe because of the economy, uh, we saw a, a slight downturn in terms of growth, but still between a 2 and 3 percent growth in application filings. One, one uh, comment with respect to last year and, and, and maybe an indicator of where the economy has, is, is going or has been, um, if you look across the technologies within the PTO in, in 2002, and remember I said we had overall between a 2 and a 3 percent growth in applications, biotechnology was way up at over 14 percent growth. We saw telecom, which, we, which had been growing at a huge rate, come down a little bit. So I think that uh, maybe there's some, some indicators there, maybe not. Um, again, remember I said about a 2 to 3 percent growth overall. Looking at, at who filed applications, U.S. applicants, the growth was about 6 percent. So the U.S. economy was still, was, were still filing applications at, a, at an increased rate of about 6 percent. Japanese filings were down over 10 percent and European filings were down over 3%. So that you can see that the, the overall U.S. applicants were, were feeding the, 
feeding the system and maybe our, our foreign applicants were not. Uh, the area of business methods, which has been a somewhat controversial over the last uh, few years down in terms of the volume of applications filed, and I've seen, I think that probably reflects what we've seen in terms of Silicon Valley and the dot-com industry. I talked about complexity. Now, that was the number, the, the volume of applications filed. Complexity is, uh, is uh, also growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, those of you who um, maybe visit our website or, or, or involved at the PTO have seen some mega applications publish as PG Pub applications. We've had applications that have published with over 6,000 claims in them. Uh, we've had applications filed with eight and 9,000 claims. I don't know what the attorney's fees were on those cases, but I'm sure they were <laughs> substantial. <laughs> um, we've, we've had an, an application in one, in one technology, and I think you could probably guess, that we accepted uh, filing on a CD-ROM because if we did not and we printed out the paper, it would have been six million pieces of paper, one application. So the bottom line is that uh, we, we, are, we are not only uh, seeing an onslaught with respect to the number of applications, but the complexity of those applications. Where do we stand today in terms of our timeliness? Uh, average pendency in 2002 from filing to issue or abandonment was 24 months. Uh, the average pendency to first action was 16.7 months. However, it varied greatly depending upon technology. And if you were filing a mechanical engineering case or if you were filing a chemical engineering case, you probably got it acted on a little bit quicker than that. If you were, if you're in the queue with a uh, internet related case, with a uh, telecom case in the uh, computer industry situation, uh, the case has probably been on the shelf for about three years and we're just around getting around to, to getting to it. So bottom line is that over, when we talk about pendency, a lot of times we'll talk about averages, but I think you really have to talk about it in terms of which technology you're in and, and, uh, and where we stand there. Presents challenges for us in terms of, of, of hiring and moving resources, and obviously what we want to do is we want to get the oldest cases done and through the system uh, first, and, and that's what we're attempting to do as we, as we uh, look at our, the management of our system. Um, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about, about making the, the USPTO a paperless office, but the reason that I'm going to talk about that is because the fact that we have over 500,000 active applications right now, pending applications at the USPTO. Paper files, and remember I talked about the fact that how large some of these applications are. We're, we're uh, located in Crystal City, just across the Potomac River. Uh, from, from D.C. We're in Arlington, Virginia, and we're spread out right now in 16 or 17 different buildings. And if you can imagine the, the task, the logistics, with respect to, uh, like I said, 16 or 17 different buildings, 10 floors on each building, a file room on every floor, one paper application for, an app, for a pending application in some building on some floor somewhere, and a paper, an amendment comes into the mailroom, and the logistics of getting that application or that paper document into an application just screams out for the, the need for an electronic system, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Those of you who have visited us in, in Crystal City probably have been to a, the public search room and B, maybe interview with a patent examiner in the core, and you've probably seen our clerks and, 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 and uh, contractors with what we call shopping carts, little, little baskets with, with rollers on them, moving all of this paper around Crystal City. We hope to, to eliminate that in the, in the very near future. Uh, we are building a new facility, uh, and uh, we will be moving from Arlington, Virginia to Alexandria, Virginia, very close to where I live. And, uh, and I had nothing to do with the site selection. <laughs> the union accused me of that. But, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, we will begin moving our examining core into the new facility this year, at the end of this year, in November of this year. Um, we will consolidate from these 15 or 16 or 17 buildings that we occupy in Crystal City to a campus of five buildings, uh, 2 million square feet. 
the key here is that we will be paying less money per year in terms of our lease. We will pay less per square foot in, in this new facility than what we pay in Crystal City. So it's also going to be a money saver for us. Um, let me talk a little bit about the strategic plan that I mentioned earlier and the fact that uh, Jim Rogan, our undersecretary, uh, came on board in the new administration, um, set out trying to figure out exactly what it is that he thought ought to be done with the USPTO in terms of improvement and program and developed a, uh, a strategic plan that, that very simply addressed three major issues, the quality of the examination process, the timeliness of the examination process, and the fact that we live in a paper world and, and need to move, desperately move to an electronic world. Uh, those of you who follow this kind of thing and, and, uh, and uh, maybe are aware of the strategic plan and the, and the fact that the uh, bill was introduced in Congress last summer probably uh, know a little bit of the background. Bottom line is that we did, we did introduce a strategic plan in June. Uh, accompanying the strategic plan was a bill that called for the raising of the, of the user fees at the USPTO. Uh, there was a hearing that occurred in the, uh, in the uh, July time frame on that fee bill. And as a result of that hearing, and maybe some, uh, some criticism that we took with respect to the fee bill and some of the portions of the strategic plan, there's been a revision of that strategic plan that's occurred over the, the fall time frame. And a revised strategic plan and a revised fee bill have been sent up to Congress. What you will see and what we will see over the next couple of months is this. First of all, there will be a hearing. And right now, the hearing is scheduled for uh, April 3rd in, in the House on the judiciary side, on the subcommittee for courts, internet, and intellectual property. And uh, Jim Rogan, our undersecretary, will testify on that, on A, the content of the strategic plan, and B, the content of the uh, new proposed fee bill. Uh, we'll also have uh, testimony from the major, some of the major user groups like the AIPLA and IPO, and, and maybe some others. Um, let me just I'm gonna hit the highlights with respect to this new strategic plan or the revised strategic plan. And let me first say that there's not a whole lot of difference, and I'll kind of the difference between the first iteration of the strategic plan and where we stand today. I'll certainly explain what the major differences are towards the end here, but uh, there are probably more in common than, than not in common between the two versions. First of all, with respect to quality, the quality of examination, and remember I said three major objectives with respect to uh, putting this plan together, the quality of examination, timeliness, and, and electronics, and electronic processing. With respect to quality, um, we're, we're looking at the types of people we hire, and how they're trained, and how they maintain their competency. First of all, in pre-employment, uh, a major component, or one of the components, is pre-employment testing. Um, every patent examiner that comes to work for us has a science or engineering degree. That's a requirement of the job. Um, however, uh, what we have found in the past and what we think is very essential to the job are our high level of oral and written communication skills. Over the last six months or so, at the last half of last year, we put in some, uh, some testing that we hadn't had in the past with respect to uh, writing samples and, and oral communication skills and personal interviews and whatnot to try to raise the level of, of uh, oral written communication skills that we hire, that folks we hire. Um, when we go out and hire, let me give you an example. Last year we hired about 780 engineers. That's a big job for us. And there's a lot, of, that, lot that goes into recruitment process and the interview process and so on and so forth. This is a big deal. And there are not, probably not many big companies that hire seven or 800 engineers in one year. We're, we're right up there. This year, we're, we'll hire about 300 based on uh, the budget we got, but we hope to increase that hiring in the future. We hope to use this pre-employment testing as, as a, uh, as a uh, part of our program. Second, as an examiner comes in the office at a lower grade and moves up through the scale, it takes about five or six years to become independent, to become a primary examiner at the USPTO. So as the, as the, as the uh, junior examiner or trainee moves through the, moves through the, uh, the, the 
the, the scale, they get increasingly uh, more uh, independence until they're finally independent at, at, at a primary examiner level. Just before we be, an examiner becomes a primary examiner at about the GS 13 level, for those of you who are familiar with our pay skills, we, uh, we, we want to have an examiner be certified. The certification of a, an examiner before they become a primary examiner will consist of three things. First of all, work review will pull an extra sampling of that examiner's work and be reviewed by managers and, and peers and others. Second, we're going to have mandatory legal training uh, in-house at the PTO with re in, in the areas of patent law, uh, evidence and procedure, and so on and so forth. And uh, we'll be bringing in professors from the local law schools and make sure that all of our examiners before they reach that certain level have had that training. And third, and maybe one of the more controversial pieces of this, as you all know, an attorney to practice before the USPTO passes a special bar, and we call it the agent's exam or the patent, the, 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 the patent bar. Uh, we're going to have our examiners pass that bar also to demonstrate their ability and to uh, move up the rank and become a primary examiner. Uh, we've, we've started to pilot this program. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we're working out the details with our, with our union right now. All of our managers will be required to take it. And so I said to myself, Nick, it's time for you to take the test. So <laughs> over the last couple of weeks, I've had it on my desk, and I've had my MPEP out. And every time I get 15 minutes, I'll, I'll answer a few questions on the test. Well, I got to tell you a story. Uh, um, I guess the word got out that I was taking the test. So uh, one of the folks that works in our enrollment and disciplinary area came up to me in the hallway, and he kind of nudges me, and he says, Nick, he says, yeah, he says, I heard you're taking the test. I said, yeah, I'm taking the test. I think I'd be able to pass it like everyone else. He says, well, don't worry. We'll make sure you pass. <laughs> and I, and I, said, I, said, I said, Harry, what's the matter? Either A, you don't think I have the ability to pass it, or B, you think I need, need help. But I, the bottom line is that I'm here to report that I passed the test. I passed the test, and uh, we'll move on from there. Um, the third thing, and uh, once an examiner becomes a primary examiner and uh, you know, has this responsibility, the question is, do they keep up with respect to the latest in terms of patent law? I mean, it's difficult. Things change. You've seen David's presentation. You know, you know very well that the, the field of patent law is, is fluid. Um, we, need our, we need our folks at the PTO to, to, to keep abreast. So we'll have a recertification process every three years. Our primary examiners will be required to, to be recertified, and that'll consist of, of work review as well as uh, required CLEs for our, for our experienced examiners. Um, that's in the area of, of, of quality. Let me move on to e-government. I talked about these 500 pending paper applications moving all around Crystal City. Um, what we intend to do and what we are in the middle of doing is, is, is uh, creating an electronic file wrapper. Uh, we will scan in every application. We will scan uh, every incoming and outgoing paper of an application so that we have a complete and electronic file wrapper. Uh, how are we going to do this? We've borrowed the European Patent Office's system. Uh, the European Patent Office is smaller than we are. It didn't scale and it didn't quite fit into our architecture, so we've modified it and uh, beefed it up and made it look more U.S.-like. But the bottom line is we've used the, used the backbone of a system that is already working in another major office in the, in the world. We have three art units that are now running on an electronic basis, 45 examiners, about five or 6,000 applications are in the system right now, and we're running that as a prototype. Come June, every new application that's filed at the USPTO will come into the office, will be scanned or put into this electronic database, and the paper and the electronic file will become the official file, and the paper will be stored in a box in a warehouse somewhere. Every, uh, after that, every uh, art unit that begins to move to the Carlisle, the new location down in Alexandria, we will scan the back file of all the applications that exist for those art units and create an electronic file. 
Um, in about a year and a half's time, we hope to have eliminated all of the paper that exists at the USPTO. What's the advantage there? It's, they're, they're pretty obvious. Obviously, we're not, we don't have these shopping carts moving around the PTO. We don't hopefully have lost papers that, that are uh, frustrating to every one of us, frustrating to us, frustrating to you. Uh, here's a big deal. You, as an applicant, through our pair system, if, if you're aware of, of some of the systems we already have at the PTO, today you can look at the contents or status of a patent application before it's published or issued with a, with a, with a, uh, with a special code as an applicant or applicant's representative. Once we have an electronic file, you'll be able to look at the entire file contents, every piece of paper in that file. You, um, as after publication of an application or after issuance of a patent, the public, not only will be able to see a patent, you'll be able to see the entire file history of a, of a, of a patent application. And, and uh, those of you who are in the field know that uh, getting the file history, seeing every office action, seeing uh, what the, the examiner said, what the attorney has said, is so, so important. And sometimes it's frustrating trying to get your hands on, these app, on, on the file history. You'll have them at your fingertips. The system works in Europe. And we're going to have it up and, and working in the United States. And uh, we're, we're very happy to, to be able to do that. S second part of and an adjunct to an electronic file wrapper and electronic processing is actually electronic filing the software to use the file an application. Right now, the vast majority, 98% of our applications are filed in paper. We've had electronic filing software for about two years, and we've had you know, several thousand applications filed, but it's not, just not catching on and not real popular. We, the USPTO, went to the expense and effort to develop that first package of software for electronic filing. Bottom line is that what we're hearing is that it's not, a, it's not as user friendly as it could be, and that's why people are not using it. What we decided here in the second go around, second generation of filing, is to not be in the software development business ourselves and to go to the private sector. So we've taken the model that the IRS has taken with respect to the IRS, is, it looks and approves software package like TurboTax, and then the TurboTax develops the software and sells it to the client. That's exactly what we're doing. And we've entered into a partnership with five commercial companies. Uh, they're developing the second generation of electronic filing software. Uh, if they don't do a good job, you won't buy it. So the bottom line is that uh, we, we, we feel that this is the way to go with respect to moving our electronic filing uh, uh, to a higher level and to a higher percentage. On the trademark side, for those of you who practice in the trademarks area, um, over 50% of the applications these days on trademarks are filed electronically. It's very, very popular, and we hope to get the patent side of the house in, in, uh, you know, in, in that, at, at that level very, very soon. Um, with respect to timeliness, what are we doing to get the backlogs down? I talked about the pendency. I talked about the fact that it's, it's different by technology. Uh, the obvious thing is to hire, and, and, and as I talked about in the past, we've, we hire uh, engineers at an alarming rate. This year, we'll probably hire only 300. Uh, the reason for that is, is the budget that, in, that we got this year, and uh, I can talk about that a little bit later. But hiring is not the only solution to the problem. As a matter of fact, it can't be the solution to the problem, the only solution to the problem. We clearly got an indication from, from the House of Representatives in our appropriations bill and the report language over the last couple of years that uh, we need to become more efficient at the USPTO and hiring our way out of the, out of the backlog is not an option. Within the strategic plan, we've come up with two or three ideas. One of them is outsourcing some of the jobs that a, that a patent examiner, some of the functions that a patent examiner does that are not directly tied to the patentability determination. One of them is pretty simple. It's classifying, classification. When a new application comes in, it has to be classified into a class and subclass. Does it go into class 43? Does it go into class 53? Um, and, and for purposes of publication as a PG pub document and, to, and routing. Uh, we've had examiners doing that in the past. We spent about 50 uh, full-time staff a year doing that. We're going to outsource that that function so that we can take that 50 staff years 
and put them against the backlog and try to bring the backlogs down. Um, outsourcing the search, probably one of the more controversial parts of the, of the strategic plan. Uh, let me say a couple things here. First of all, number one, uh, we're going to attempt to do this, but we're going we're to go very slowly. We're going to do a proof of concept here. We're going to put out some, uh, some proposals and, and look for some companies, corporations, uh, maybe some folks that already have experience in the field of searching, maybe by technology, and we're going to contract for some searches. Uh, we're going to start out by uh, having them do some PCT Chapter 1 search reports for us. We'll evaluate the quality of those searches and maybe build up a, a cadre of contractors that can work for us, that can deliver from an application, a raw, raw application, a search that they've done so that we can hand it off to the patent examiner. By doing that, we hope that the patent examiner can become more efficient and, and uh, move forward and be able to move through more applications greater rate so that we can again try to bring this backlog that we have down. Another thing that we're doing that's somewhat similar is we've been partnering with the European Patent Office and the Japanese Patent Office. If you think about it, you know in your practice or you know the people that you talk to these days, it's very rare for someone to say, I want to I get a patent in the United States, but I'm not worried about Europe or Japan. Of course they're worried about Europe and Japan. If they want to protect their, their, their technology, they need worldwide protection. So what does an applicant do? They file an application in many countries at least in Japan and the European Patent Office. Well, think about it. We're all doing the same work. The identical application shows up in the three offices, gets handed off to a patent examiner in each of the three offices, and they start by doing the search. What we propose to do and what we're in the middle of testing is the office of first filing will, will do the initial search and hand that search off to the office of second filing so the office of second filing at least has a starting point has a prior art that's found in the initial search. And hopefully, again, we're in the process of gaining some efficiency. We've exchanged 500 searches with the EPO over the last couple of months. We're doing an evaluation of, 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 the, of uh, the prior art that they found and, and how, what the outcome of, of, of uh, the prosecution would, have be, would be only with that prior art to see whether or not we can take full advantage of that. Um, those are, the, those are the major areas within the strategic plan. I talked about the fact that, uh, um, A, there's going to be a fee bill, and, and the fee bill is to, is to pay, for these, pay for these programs and pay for these improvements. The fee bill that's now on the Hill is, is a scaled-down version of the one that was introduced uh, last summer. Uh, last summer, that if, if you looked at and compared, and, and you probably read some stories about if I filed an application with all the fees that were in this new fee bill, it would have cost me X thousands of dollars. And, and uh, many, much of that was tied to the large numbers of claims that might have been filed in an application. The bottom line is what's happened in the new fee bill and is that it's, uh, it's been scaled back and scaled back uh, fairly considerably. Let me give you some, just some rough comparisons. Right now, large entity filing fee is $750. Under the new fee bill, it'll be $1,000. We still have small entity uh, discounts, and so half price for, for small entities. Um, one of the big problems or the big areas that we saw a controversy in in the first fee bill was the escalating costs for high numbers of claims. Um, scaled that back to just one level of, of, of uh, fee for claim. Right now, uh, independent claims over three, it's an $84 charge. It, under the new fee bill, it'll be 200, but it, it'll stay 200 for every, every additional claim over, over three. Um, and that's a significant difference from what we've seen in the past. Uh, the issue fee goes up $100 from $1,300 to $1,400, and some of the maintenance fees go up uh, uh, just a few hundred dollars. I've, I, I encourage you to become familiar with the, with the new fee bill and, and uh, you know, decide for yourself whether you uh, feel that you can support it. I hope you can support it because we need, we, need the, we, need the, uh, we need the change here. We need to address these issues that I've been talking about. Let me talk about some of the substantive changes between the first iteration and the second iteration, then I'll try to wind up and, and maybe get some, some questions from all. First of all, in, the, in, the, in that first strategic plan, there was a provision for deferred examination. 
there was a provision that an applicant could file for a very low fee, a filing, a, a file, have a filing, a very low filing fee, and then trigger examination with an examination fee up to 18 months later. That's a system that's popular internationally, but has not, uh, we've never had it at, in, in the U.S. We've dropped that provision. We've dropped that provision. That, that does not occur in the, new, in, the, in the new bill. You will have a traditional filing fee up front of the $1,000, and that will automatically entitle you to, to prosecution and, and, of, and of the application. Um, we had talked about contracting out searches in the first iteration of the strategic plan. The applicant was going to go find a, a contractor and have that search done and then submit it to the USPTO, paying for it themselves prior to filing. We've scratched that idea. Uh, if we contract out searches and that becomes something that's doable for us, it'll be through us. In other words, the fees you pay up front out of the $1,000 will take a portion of that to pay the contractor and we'll deal with the contractor in terms of, of getting a search. Um, we talked about information disclosure statements being mandatory. We've backed off that. They'll be voluntary. Uh, unity of invention versus restriction practice. For those of you in the biotech area, it's a big deal. Uh, what we have agreed to do here is to sit down and study hard the unity of invention standard versus the restriction standard. And hopefully we can work out some, some uh, issues and come up with some proposal or piece of legislation that we'll introduce in the 108th and 8th Congress that will allow us to reach some, some, uh, some medium with respect to addressing the needs of the biotech community with respect to unity versus restriction practice. Um, talk about, so bottom line is these are the components. We're accomplishing three things, quality, timeliness, and electronic government. Uh, where do we go next? The hearing on, on, uh, on April 3rd will, will tell a lot in terms of whether or not we're going to get support from the user community. If we get support from the user community, we'll get, some more, we'll get support on the Hill. Um, my personal opinion will be that, for the most part, the content-wise, there is support for the strategic plan. What the, prob the problem still exists with fee diversion, and that's going to be the major, major issue with respect to the, uh, the user community. The idea of user fees, and I mentioned before, in excess of a billion dollars being paid to the USPTO, and not, not having all of those user fees appropriated back to the PTO to sink into these programs is, is just um, um, not acceptable to the, to the, obviously, to the IP user community. We've been working, and Jim Rogan, our undersecretary, has been working very hard within this administration to try to solve that problem. Secretary of Commerce Don Evans has testified now on the 04 budget between, uh, in front of both the House of Representatives and the Senate, actually yesterday in front of the Senate. In both of those testimonies, he has stated that this administration plans to and wants to eliminate the diversion of fees at the USPTO. That's a big step. To get, to get the administration to state for the record the elimination of diversion is a big deal. Now we've got to work on Congress. We have to work on the appropriations committees. I'm going to wrap up by just mentioning a couple of other issues to keep on the radar screen and to keep aware of here in the, over the next couple of months and then uh, maybe answer a few questions. First of all, we're changing our address. I know this sounds like a stupid thing and, and, and a very simple thing, but we come May 1st, we are changing our address in, in preparation for moving down to Alexandria. We'll change from a D.C. zip code to a Virginia zip code. Uh, the important factor there is this. Uh, last year, uh, right after 9-11 and the anthrax situation in the Washington area, especially in the, in the, in the uh, Washington, D.C. Brentwood Post, post Office, um, believe it or not, that's where our mail went. It, our, all of our mail, our D.C. zip code, went through the Brentwood Post Office. So um, our mail was diverted and has been irradiated and, and continues to be irradiated. Um, they've worked out a lot of the problems. We no longer have a melted floppy disks and, and, fried, uh, <laughs> and fried paper, although we've, we've seen some of those in the past. But the bottom line is that movement 
to this new zip code in Virginia will bring the mail through uh, the suburbs in, in Merrifield, Virginia, and eliminate the need for irradiation. Uh, the second thing that you're going to see uh, uh, in terms of a, a rule package very shortly is a, as a new process for submitting amendments. And we've had over the last couple of years a process where two copies of, of an amendment uh, needed to be submitted to the PTO, a clean copy and a marked up copy. We're eliminating the need for two, and all we're asking you to do is send us in one copy of the amendment with uh, the old uh, brackets and underlining to indicate where we've added material and where we've taken out material. Hopefully, one copy is, is, is better than, than having to make two, and it's, it's going to help you out and it's going to help us out. That little experiment didn't work. And I guess the third thing, and the thing I've already mentioned, is that we will be putting out a notice for public comment on this issue of unity of invention, and we really like your input in terms of, of how we can you know, redo our system, with the, the, our current system, which is the restriction practice system, to better accommodate the needs, especially in the biotech area where we seem to be uh, having the most difficulty with respect to restriction. Um, with that, I'm going to close. I want to thank you very much for, for having me here. I'd be very happy to answer a few questions. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, and again, I, I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to come down and, and get out of Washington for the day. Thank you. And there's some questions right here. Yes, sir. First of all, who has to read this $6 million or $6 million application? As long as it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> second one more seriously. Um, you talked about um, outsourcing the searching. There's been some complaint that searching is one of the ways that the examiner uses to educate themselves in the subject matter of the patent. Are you combating that and using some other methods? Um, yeah, the question had to do with outsourcing. The first question had to do with uh, the six million page patent, and uh, I kidded because it is assigned over in the in the it's the bi it's in the biotech area. Area. I'm sure you probably figured that one out. Um, you know, we have an average. Every examiner has a has a production goal, and it's 20 hours per or whatever. I, I'm only kidding. Now, I, I hope you understand that. But uh, so as long as we get it done in 20 hours, I don't care who. Does. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, with respect to outsourcing the search, yeah, the you know, I was an examiner. I started examining 30 years ago at the PTO. Um, I, I know that you do learn from doing the search. But I tell you what, you also learn from reading the spec and reading the prior art. And you're still going to do that. You're going to read every spec. You're going to read all of the prior art that comes into the search. As a matter of fact, that prior art may be more concentrated so that it's more relevant and, and so on. So bottom line is that um, we feel, and again, only with proof of concept, only with real testing this out to see whether it works or not, um, we feel that we can take advantage and gain some efficiencies by using searches that either, that either have been done in another off, a foreign office, like the EPO or the JPO, or have been given to us by a contractor. It's very similar to an IDS coming in, where the applicant is, is supplying us a search. It's a jumping off point. It's a starting point. Hopefully, it's the concentration of the best art out there. Not to say that we're, our examiners won't have the ability to supplement the search, to go out and hit hit our search databases and try to see if they can find, you know, uh, more art surrounding it. If they're not comfortable with it, it's, it's, it's not going to be all or nothing kind of a situation. And, uh, but we, we really need to, to try to, to speed the flow of the work through the office, and that's what we're trying to accomplish with this. Grant? Yeah. yeah. So I, I have a question. So how exactly are you going to determine then um, whether if, if an examiner is still going to be able to look at it, at the, do his own searching? How are you going to know whether the, the good art um, came from his own searching or came from, you know, from some outsourced? Um, so the question is, how do, how do we, I think there were two questions there. How do we know whether the art came from the outsource or the examiner or whether the examiner is going to have the ability to do more searching? Absolutely, the examiner will have the opportunity and the ability to do more searching. I mean, right now, um, the examiners are very, very experienced. I mean, uh, you know, they, they work in a, in a very specified field of technology, they get a feel for, for what the, the prior art that surrounds an invention is. We will allow, I mean, like I said to the, the previous, the previous uh, gentleman, uh, those examiners will have the discretion to expand the search uh, that they're handed to start, to start the process with. Uh, let me just clarify a little bit. Um, 
I was in Stanford last year, actually. And it just, it seemed to me that, uh, and this is a concern of a lot of my, I guess, ex-colleagues. Um, when you're doing a lot of searching, and part of the process of searching is, is first of all, finding, finding the stuff. Like when we get a lot of IDSs from um, applications, a lot of the times, I mean, we get, like, even if they make special, it just seems, and, and they have, like, a list of, you know, they, get, they go out and get a, a special search. It still seems to a lot of examiners that we still have to do our own, like, search, and we never really get a lot of, of good, you know, good material from, from the stuff that we're getting, getting from the applications. And then, also, with, with, with outsourcing classification, whenever we have, if, if we get an application and we are not able to transfer it to the correct um, part unit, then it just seems like if an outside um, outsourced company uh, contractor um, classifies it incorrectly, you know, it, it just seems like internally we would be able to classify it better. The primaries that are doing it now, they know the art, and they they know where they should go. It seems like a lot of this outsourcing that's being done will actually just cost a lot more time for the examiner. If, It'll cost a lot for the PTO because they have to do outsourcing. It'll cost a lot for the examiner because then he'll have all this, this stuff to go through when he could just do his own good search. Sounds like you've been talking to our union president. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, I'm only kidding, Grant. I, you know, um, again, the, the bottom line here, and, and I know there's going to be differences of opinion on whether this is, this is a doable and whether this is the right thing to do. But the bottom line is that um, starting from scratch to do a search or starting from a starting point of having a consolidated body of prior art and then taking that as a jumping off place and moving forward from there, those are the two situations we're talking about. We're going to do what delivers the best quality and there's no doubt about it. And, the, and, and I, just, I just, you know, believe that there are efficiencies to gain if we give the examiner a good starting off point by give, giving them prior art that an expert feels is the best prior art, the examiner will take it from there. And the examiner has the ultimate decision to make on, on patentability and will have all the tools that they've always had to, to take it from there. But they won't be starting from scratch. They'll be starting with, with, some, with some prior art. Back in the back. Right. The question was, what, did State Street cause a, a f flood of applications to come into the USPTO? I think the answer is yes for about two years. And now, no. I, I, I can, I'm giving you rough numbers now, but, but Class 705, which is traditionally, you know, what we, you know, computer uh, implemented uh, business methods, you know, probably before the State Street Bank decision, we were getting uh, 1,500 applications a year. It grew to about 8,000 applications a year. Last year, it dropped off to 6,000 applications. So I, I, it went like this, and now it's come back down, and it, it's starting to level off. We talk about 330,000 applications filed at the US, USPTO, and that the biggest year we had in business methods was only 8,000 applications. It's not a, it doesn't account for a huge growth. I think when I'm talking about growth, I'm talking about sustained growth across all areas of technology, biotechnology, computer-related technology, not just business methods. We're able to tell how many, uh, a percentage of applicant applications result from the self-administration of restriction practices, like I say, simultaneous filing of similar subject matter. That's a good question. How many times did an applicant just file multiple applications rather than in a single application and have us divide it out? I don't have that, those, you know, kind of numbers in my head to be perfectly honest with you. We've done many studies with respect to restriction practice standards versus unity standards, digging through some old files to figure out would we have examined more inventions per application using the unity standard rather than the restriction standard. The answer to that is yes. I mean, the, the, the conventional thinking is under unity standard, more, type, more inventions or more types of claims would be contained in a single application rather than, you know, restricted out and, and, and divisionals filed.
the effect on the examination and the effect on prosecution history estoppel. And I would think that the litigation bar would have a lot to say about the pluses and minuses of handling different uh, levels of invention in the same application uh, because of claim, claim changing and, and uh, it might really change the contours of uh, wrapper estoppel uh, issue today. Well, we're going to go through two rounds of public comment on this before coming up with any proposal. Uh, first one this spring and another one next fall. We want to zero in on, on uh, public comment in terms of what standard should be. Then we're going to do a business case study to show, well, what would that cost? <laughs> and then put out some options and have another round of public comment on those. But I'm, I, you're right. Right now we're hearing a lot from the biotech bar. We want more inventions per application. But there are pluses and minuses, and we want to hear from everyone before we put together what might be a proposal for legislation. Would your proposal handle the protection against double patenting, which is present if you now start off with a single application and simply split in response to a restriction requirement? That's going to be a major issue that will have to have to be addressed with respect to uh, the sta any standard we use, whether it be a unity standard, whether it be a restriction standard. One of, the, one of the other pieces of the puzzle is whether or not the unity standard is a, is a PCT type unity standard where you can actually just pay more <laughs> fees and get more inventions examined in the, in the same application or whether it's an EPO type of unity standard we actually file a divisional application. Bottom line, there are a lot of issues um, and it, it will increase the workload at the PTO, no doubt about it. And um, if, if we're going to do that, it'll have to be, it'll have to be funded some way. Yes, sir. One other quick question. Okay. Um, you mentioned how many new um, examiners you're hiring. How are you doing on retaining older examiners? Well, see all the gray hair? I've been here 30 <laughs> years, so <laughs> you at least one of them is there. No, I, I've, got some, I've, got, I've got some good news on that. Um, maybe partly because of the economy, but partly because of some of the other things we've done. We've gone from about a 14% attrition rate to a 6% attrition rate. 14% uh, uh, four years ago, and seven, seven, and now six. Bottom line is that A, I think the economy has a little bit to do with that, but B, um, we, we were uh, able to, within government and through the red tape in government, believe it or not, we were able to, uh, uh, secure a slightly higher pay scale for patent examiners as opposed to other engineers in government. And that, that's helped us some both from a recruiting standpoint and a retention standpoint. But a 6% uh, a six percent turnover rate is much better than a 14% turnover rate. And we've seen that level for about three years now. So we're hoping that that's, that's a trend and that's good for us. With that, I want to thank you very much and again uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thanks a lot. Commissioners, thank you very much for coming. We have a 15-minute uh, break now. Let's try to keep it right to 15 minutes and then uh, we'll resume with uh, Jim Lampert. Well, it was a little delayed.